Therefore, we cannot say, when I have achieved this, I have proved. If I study that, I shall be enlightened. If I follow this master, I shall be uh, illumined. It might happen from any one of those causes. But the moment he's, anyone says, by this it will happen. Some very subtle law of spiritual value is destroyed. And these subtle laws become more real than the grosser laws we know when we begin to function in a very attenuated and subtle sphere of consciousness. So it is not that Buddha uh, intends for us to imply a total disregard for this or a total disregard for that, but rather to take the same attitude that he took with the Brahman. If a wise man says there is a God, I agree with him. If the wise man says there is no God, I agree with him. Because actually, the moment we lock ourselves in disagreement with the wise man, we become about as stupid as any human being can be. Because we can only do this on one assumption, that we know more than he does. And we end up by trying to affirm that we know more than God does. And this always ends in embarrassment. <laughs> Therefore, we cannot, with the faculties that we possess, say this or that. All we can do is to seek. To seek with everything we have for the good that surpasseth understanding. And if we lock our mind in this religion or in that religion, then we are in trouble. It is not that the religion may be wrong, nor is it true that the religion will not lead us there. But the moment we say this and no other will lead us there, or lead me there, we are then dogmatizing over something we do not understand. And we are not illumined, but heavily creed-bound uh, with certain dogmas that are forever getting in the way of our own growth. Therefore, we notice in the world several kinds of people. People who are very sure of everything and usually very uncomfortable, unhappy, unadjusted. The individual who passes judgment continuously is one who has experienced little. The more we become acquainted with value, the less certain we become of anything except the ultimate fact of value. If we walk one path, it is the only path. But if we sincerely walk two paths, then there are two paths we have experienced. And if with a certain charity of consciousness, we walk one path and wish well to another man who is walking another path nearby, then we share in a common understanding. But all paths walked by the righteous lead to righteousness. And it is not the path but the one who walks it that determines whether or not the goal shall be achieved. The worst religion in the world can lead the good man to heaven because it cannot corrupt the good man. And if it corrupts him or corrupts anyone, it is because they are weak, not because they are good. The, the true person cannot be deceived because he will take any symbol that is presented to him and interpret it in the term of truth. On the other hand, the truest symbol in the world presented to the person who does not have this understanding cannot reveal to him the fact. It is a very subtle thing, but it is something that every truth seeker has to work with in his own experience. This experience of realizing that reality is everywhere and that the good man is ever near to it, regardless of what he believes. And the person who has bound himself by intellectual limitations is among the furthest from it. He is not as near as the simple aborigine or the small child. 
Because these others, the child and the aborigine, have directness, have simplicity, and have that kind of insight which is denied the person who has destroyed his own insight by artificial sophistication. So I think the lesson that Buddha teaches us on that point is very worthwhile and uh, has much to do with the achievement of well-being. Now, there is another section in here which I also think uh, is very important, but we pass over it rather lightly, and therefore I'd like to bring out certain additional material in relation to it. We mention in here the four caste systems as they were taught and understood in India. And we divide for this purpose of this meditation study uh, existence as we know it into four lokas or regions or guarded over by the four kings of the corners of the world that are called the lokapalas. These four regions are called the sacerdotal sphere the administrative sphere, the economic sphere, and the sphere of crafts and trades. Now, these are the four uh, castes of Hinduism. And this division, whether we recognize it or not, is not an arbitrary bit of Hindu theology. It is an obvious and inevitable division of society. A society which divides instinctively into levels. Now, the growth of man in the course of ages has gradually resulted in the loss of clear lines of demarcation between these levels. There was a time when a man was born into one of these castes, and in this he remained as long as he lived, and his sons and their sons after him. But with the passing of time, the general elevation of the state of man has resulted in the human being inhabiting two or more of these castes simultaneously. He has not necessarily broken through the caste system, but he has achieved a status which enables him to be in more than one sphere of activity at one time. And also, To go back to the statement that we first made prior to this, namely these four states or conditions used to have very arbitrary religious and philosophical meaning. And it was assumed that only the Brahmin or the administrator could hope to attain to enlightenment. Buddha broke through this barrier with a tremendous crash in the 6th century B.C. And while the times and uh, circumstances have shifted in Asia, the whole world has now also broken through this concept and has come to the final conclusion that due to the natural circumstances of living, average persons are arranged in these groups, but that these groups are no longer walls or barriers, they are roads and bridges leading to a certain distinct and purposeful end. Perhaps the one of the most interesting points, for instance, is this uh, consideration of the fourth state, class, caste, or sphere, which we mention here as the sphere of the crafts and trades, involving labor, production, also the agriculturists, the craftsmen, the mechanics, and these phases of human life. Now, this is no longer what it used to be. Up to the 17th century of the Christian era in Europe, there was no difference in the words which stood for, which now stand for artist and artisan. The word artist, as we know it today, did not exist. That word is less than 300 years old as having any meaning apart from artisan. In other words, a man who was an artisan might put a good uh, sole on a pair of shoes. 
in the 16th century, he could be indiscriminately referred to as either an artisan or an artist. We had no division between these. In the development of folk arts and folk crafts today, the same situation presents itself. Some of our most marvelous creative activity today is on the level of crafts and arts, rather than on the level of the great superior forms of knowledge that were once regarded as sublime. We are not at all sure today that there is any essential difference in art value between a little cup that was made by the tens of thousands by a Korean potter and the finest piece of Havel in China that you can buy. In fact, in, o in the Orient and among some European collectors, you can buy the most beautiful piece of Havel in China, oh, $500 or $1,000, then you're really paying a high price for it. But for a little old crude Korean bowl that is almost shapeless and has just a little glaze dripping down one side, you may have to pay $50,000. The first, the Havel in China, was designed by an artist. The bowl was made by an artisan. And at the present time, the work of the artisan is worth a hundred times the work of the artist. He is the greater artist. So therefore, you are not sure just what you're dealing with. And in this problem of the dividing of man into various levels, we come to this important philosophical fragment of insight, which I think we should know. Man is today largely a divided personality. In China, the idea of the transcendent being uh, multiplying itself, as described in this book, meant that, as in the story of Buddha, that when the time came uh, for the illumination of the world, Buddha multiplied himself and appeared simultaneously in the 33 worlds. By an extension of himself, therefore, he was present in the highest regions of the abstract universe and at the same time in the lowest, densest, and most troubled regions of Avicii or hell. He was immediately present everywhere by this mystery of the transcendent being. And it is also ref uh, referred in legend, at least, that during the so-called three days in the grave, Jesus went down into the underworld to re relieve the souls of the lost. This is still celebrated as part of the church ritual. So here we have man now, no longer a separate being, and no longer needing adjustment merely upon one level or plane, but finding it increasingly necessary to render unto Caesar those things which are Caesar's in each of the spheres of his life. So today we have in the human being all of these elements combined in one. We have man the priest. We have man in this capacity as the great guardian of his own soul. We have man the administrator. Here by wisdom and understanding, by learning and knowledge, he must lead the course of his own life. He must make the rational decision. He must also engage with others in the common problems of leadership and administration. Then we have man as the worker, in the sense of the economist. We have the man who must make a living, who must buy and sell, must exchange commodities, <coughs> must maintain the elaborate and involved structure of what we call the financial patterns under which we live. And even if these patterns should change sometime, still some pattern will be there, requiring adjustment uh, to the problems of mutual cooperation and effort for mutual survival. Then we have man the craftsman, the laborer, the builder, who must create in various ways all the things which he needs, either directly or indirectly. He must also have the creative instinct of making a better world. Here is your agriculturist who must uh, feed the world. Here are all the various lines of activity. And in symbolism, they can be in one person. They can represent the levels of his own nature. 
and then so representing these levels, they uh, terminate by causing a person to be more than one individual. He is bound together by a total consciousness, which to a measure determines the degree of relationship of all of these spheres of action to his own nature. But in his meditation and in his reflection, and in his practice of mystical discipline, he cannot function solely on one level. If he does, he accomplishes a discord or a division within himself. He must find the synthesizing agent of his own understanding, and he must adjust himself properly, reasonably, and normally upon all levels. The individual who devotes his life to meditation and someone else has to work to supply him with bread is not the true person. He is not the true disciple. The individual who does not assume all of the reasonable duties which are involved in life, but thinks of spirituality as an evasion of these duties or an escape from them, or that by holiness he shall escape the need for these adjustments. This person is following, of course, the old ascetic ideas of ancient Hinduism and even primitive Christianity. But he is not following the doctrine of the pure land. He is not following this concept that gradually took over, that the person has to bring all of himself into a kind of normal or proper integration. Integration must therefore be a fulfillment of the person rather than an effort of the person to escape from level to level, to leave behind that which is unpleasant or uncomfortable in some region where adjustment has not been attained. If the person neglects his administrative faculties, he is in trouble. If, however, in the cause of administration, he neglects his spiritual values, he is also in trouble. If in his search for inner understanding, he ignores his economic responsibilities, he not only uh, creates a problem for himself, but loses the respect of his fellow men. And if in the various processes in which he is concerned, he does not make creative contribution, if he does not in some way or other make two blades of grass grow where one grew before, he is also being unfair to his world, and he is failing in that proper and orderly progress by means of which his nature will ultimately be brought to quietude. The end, of course, is quietude. And this quietude cannot come if the four unreconciled castes are constantly at war with each other. In the old Hindu system, the sudra, or the slave, was always resenting his superiors in class. The Brahmin was looking down upon the merchant. The warrior was looking down upon the agriculturist. And, of course, the agriculturist and the uh, lower type of mechanic had no direction to look except up, and there he saw nothing but his superiors. This was a, uh, not a proper attitude. Yet it is an attitude that can happen to us, not in just the same way, perhaps, but just as seriously. For all these old stories are symbolic accounts of values which have to be experienced and with which we must become gradually informed. The human being also, by natural instinct, has the attributes of the forecast. Now, instinct cannot be frustrated. Instinct must be unfolded until man discovers that the truth instinct is the energy behind all other instincts. Until he finds that out, he has not achieved. Therefore, it is not the frustration of instinct, but the normalization of it. 
by which under proper condition all instincts lead to that which is good, that which is proper, that which is next. Of course, one of our problems is that instincts may seem too slow for us. They only show us the next thing, when what we want is ten jumps ahead. This is, of course, unfortunate, because we cannot achieve uh, unless we take each step. The effort to escape or to jump across vast intervals without thoroughly grounding ourselves as we proceed will lead to the most dangerous spiritual accidents. Thus, the problem of the person is that he has a kind of fourfold personality, the elements of which must all find their own peace. The man who works with his hands or finds this part of his outlet must find peace in this work. He must find in it the gradual uh, experiencing of universal. When he weaves, or draws, or paints, or carves, or whittles, he is working toward universal creative expression. And as he finds the laws in his crafts and arts, he becomes more and more capable of adoring the master of law. And therefore we have the ancient cults and secret societies and orders of artisans and architects and stone cutters. These were no longer simply building houses for princes and tyrants. They were chewing the stone of character for the glory of the eternal God. And as the old Essene masters of Syria felt that every time they built a house, they were bringing the sense of family and of home and of security and of value to human beings. Therefore, to build a house was an act of worship. To make a work of art is an act of worship. To produce something that is pleasant, beautiful, satisfying, these things are acts of worship. A man worships as he plants the seeds in the earth, just as much as he does before the altar of the church. And the same way in economics. And, of course, the history of the economic sphere is one of the rockiest in the entire history of man's experience. In many nations, particularly in some of the Far Eastern countries, the merchant is regarded as the lowest of all classes and has difficulty even surviving. But in, in the end, for some unexplained reason, the merchant ends up with everything. No matter whether he is despised or not, he ends up with the goods. He has a mysterious ability to survive. Now, merchandising we regard in many ways as a kind of of parasitical way of life. But under the conditions in which we live, with the tremendous diversification of products, the need of the transportation of products and the distribution of them through incredible areas, merchandising and the whole theory of economics has taken on a basic integrity. We have to have it. Therefore, we are no longer dealing with an evil unless it is abused. And the individual engaged in these projects has also the right to pride, the right to the recognition that through the distribution of these things necessary to man, he is contributing to the well-being of man. Now, it may well be that he makes a profit so doing. But if his primary pride is in the fact that he is serving a need, he may take a reasonable profit with honor. But if his only consideration is profit, and he merely grudgingly serves the world's need, then this individual is spiritually wrong. And if this person should, by some means or circumstances, decide to become religious, he must certainly correct this basic error in himself and his relationship to his world and his life. If he does not, he's in trouble. He does not mean that he has to give up his merchandise, but he has to revitalize the true motive behind value, and have that motive first, and serve that motive first, with a realization that if he stands firmly upon his motive, those things which are otherwise necessary shall be added unto him. It is his motive. Is he in business, 
because he believes that the world has a need which he must supply. If he has this basic conviction, and it is real, it will not interfere with his spiritual growth, but will advance it. But to have this conviction means that he must obey it, must vitalize it, and must sacrifice if necessary for it. But if his conviction is right, then the thing which he is doing is right. And he will then administer what he is doing honorably. The same is true in the administrative sphere or in the profession. We have the common problem that we think of so often of the doctor. If the primary motive of the doctor is the recovery of the patient, if he recognizes himself as a priest of the healing arts, and this is his primary consideration, he is entitled to what reasonable support he needs, for the workman is worthy of his hire. He is entitled to whatever is properly a reward for work well accomplished. He will be paid. It is a byproduct of work well done. But the primary motive in his own consciousness must sincerely and honorably be that he desires to devote his energy, his time, and his life to the service of the sick that he may bring them back, if possible, to such health as may be possible by the knowledge which he possesses. His motive must be right. If it is so right, then it is also true of the diplomat, the politician, the statesman. These may advance to any condition that their honor may bring them to, so long as they do not dishonor their own honor. But that person who desires office merely for ambition is already wrong. And if that same person <coughs> should attempt some form of religious or spiritual training, he can get nowhere until he corrects his own motive. And the same in the sacerdotal set. If the servant of God, the priest, the administrator, the minister, the clergyman, if these persons have as their primary end the service of God and their fellow man, then their way is indicated. And they are entitled to that which is necessary for them to be able to supply that need as effectively and as joyously and as pleasantly as possible. But if this motive is not right, if our theologian is merely a church politician, then this individual is deprived of all religious insight by that circumstance alone. He cannot know the real. Now, we may not be chosen to such a great decision as this, but in each walk of life, in whatever we are doing, if our motive is not instinctively right, it is then instinctively wrong. Now, we can live comparatively well with a comparatively inadequate motive. We can drift along, as millions have before us, from the cradle to the grave, and our motives will be responsible only for gradual hardening of the arteries. But, if in this way of life we suddenly develop a yen for religion, suddenly we decide to be spiritual, and we begin this difficult path of trying to find out what truth is and how we could attain to it, then these motives stand as guardians by the gate. Like the, like the scowling lion dog. With their strange intuition, they cannot be deceived. And the individual striving to go on is blocked entirely by the general pattern of his own inadequate motive. So the need constantly to make sure that as we dedicate ourselves to something better, that we have cleaned house, that these motives upon which so much depends have themselves been properly cleansed. For if they have not, we are in trouble. These motives, extending into many spheres of life, bring with them all that they imply, and uh, we cannot escape them at any time. If, then, 
you go on a little further in our book, uh, you will find the little story here about the D.R.K. 